Hello everyone, and welcome to my second foray into Primordial Kerbal Space Program. In this episode, I hope to explore KSP versions 0 .10, 0.11, and 0.12. And uh, first we start off, of course, with 0 0.10. Nothing obviously different on the start screen here, though I already did some setting stuff. There are new joystick settings, and so I... Uh, tried to set up my joystick but uh, as we'll soon see I didn't do a very good job of it. Uh, here the KSC looks uh, similar to what it was in point zero nine. Uh, but well, secondly, I guess we'll call it point zero nine now. It is a complication with uh, now we're gonna get point nine zero. Anyway, but as you can see the tutorials are the same, the parts are all the same, nothing particularly new here so I immediately start building the same rocket that I did in point zero nine. And so uh, here it is, the rocket that successfully took the Kerbals into orbit in that, in the uh, first episode of Primordial KSP. And so I just go ahead and name it Orbiter 1, completely confident, and uh, try to launch it. You'll notice my pitch, though, has a bit of an issue there. Um, but uh, that's not the only issue. I was also facing the fact that my throttle was backwards. I... Uh, I messed up on setting up the throttle. Uh, normally I just copy my configuration file over from save to save so I forget that I actually have to reverse the throttle. So I'm using a joystick of course and I have two throttles. And so uh, I have to remember to reverse the throttle in order to make it work properly. And right now the pitch is being mapped to my second throttle instead of to the main joystick itself. So that's why it's all the way down like that. I don't notice that just yet. I'll eventually figure it out, but uh, it so happens that uh, it's all right to control a craft without being able to control the pitch, uh, be, uh, at least uh, if you're doing most of your maneuvers in two dimensions, which we are, we're sticking to a heading of about 90 degrees. So it's okay to not have pitch as long as you have roll and yaw, they can substitute for it. Anyway, but that's just technicality here. Uh, the same sort of launch that we had before and uh, separation and ignition of the second stage. Kerbals are all excited right here. I guess they know that this is a tried and tested craft but uh, here we see it going awry for the first time because of the pitch issue. Uh, they are not phased at all. I guess they assume that that is a normal state of affairs. But I quickly uh, get back under control realizing the problem and uh, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what to do about the pitch, the fact that it's mapped to that uh, throttle, but for now SAS can hold things steady. SAS of course is very vigilant in these early versions of uh, KSP. It just basically holds it exactly where you leave it and uh, that's it. And I can see, I'm sure some people uh, miss this old version of SAS, uh, and uh, then there is the new version, which everybody else is used to. It sort of depends on what you're used to, I guess. Oop, a little bit of explosion there as this one ignited. So this is just an attempt at orbit, really. Still no map view, but uh, you'll notice some landscape improvements. Uh, the look of the land is uh, much better in terms of the levels of detail. As we uh, get higher and higher, it doesn't uh, sort of flash in and out and get all... And the co coastlines aren't constantly changing. If you saw the earlier versions of KSP, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the pitch issue and what to do about it now. I'm, I'm going to eventually set the throttle to a neutral position and just uh, skip pitch altogether. There we go. So now I'll just use uh, roll and yaw to control everything. Anyway, uh, but the earlier versions that you saw in the first episode of Primordial KSP, uh, the coastlines kept sort of changing, and that's because levels of detail as we moved out uh, were sort of glitchy. But here you can see the coastlines very consistent here, so that is uh, another big bonus of this version in addition to the joystick control. So smooth levels of detail, but otherwise uh, there was very little difference between this version and version 0.09. Now you saw me uh, boosting up there. 
uh, trying to figure out, because I don't have a map view, trying to figure out where my apoapsis is and all. I ended up in an orbit of about uh, 250 kilometers, so you see me passing 200 kilometers here. About 250 kilometers by 55 kilometers was the, I mean, I, I, you might call it suborbital, but um, it's it's an orbit actually. It goes around the planet and it will successfully go around. Yuri Gagarin's orbit, uh, one side was technically uh, fairly low in the, uh, I mean, comparatively low in the atmosphere. So it works out like that. Here I'm still retro burning because uh, at uh, 55 kilometers I will not be brought down to the surface and I actually want to come back down. So here we are approaching the coastline of the home continent. But I'm a little bit short here. I really should be higher. But it was tough to tell that, of course, from where I was. And we are approaching very steeply, as you can see. But uh, yeah, at least we hit the home continent. That's uh, that's a plus. And now the Kerbals are, uh, well, mixed. Uh, Jeb is, of course, always confident, but the other two are are scared. No reason to be, though as long as we uh, eventually release this stage and engage the parachute. Well, honestly though, the fact that the parachute brings the capsule down at about 12 meters per second is a little bit disconcerting. After all, that's, that's um, almost 30 miles an hour. Run out of fuel, release all that, parachute, parachute deploys. There you go, 12.7-ish. Uh, There's an explosion for you, for those waiting for one. And yeah, very fast. I, I wonder why they decided. Maybe it's because they didn't want to wait so long while this drifted down. But really, I wonder why uh, 12 meters per second was the chosen descent speed for the parachutes. Anyway, capsule is alright. We can move on. We see 6.6 G's there, yeah. I was wondering whether the G-force reading ever got fixed. I, I don't know if it's fixed even now, but 6.6 uh, .6 G's sounded uh, reasonable, but uh, I didn't know whether it was correct. Anyway, here's uh, KSP version 0.11, and here we get some serious improvements I think uh, we all appreciate. So let's, let's get started. First of all, you'll notice that the Space Center no longer has the roads ringing it. It actually has that runway there. Uh, well, at least I, I think it's a prototype runway, let's call it. There aren't any space plane parts or stuff like that. What we do have is RCS. You can see there an RCS fuel tank and RCS thruster block. Also, we've got an advanced SAS unit next to that. Okay, go over there. Over there. You can see the new part. There you go. Advanced SAS. I'm trying here to figure out what the heck the difference is between the SAS module and the advanced SAS module. The only thing I can see is that the SAS module has a uh, max torque of 10, but there's no torque reading for the advanced SAS, so I'm wondering whether it's really that advanced at all. But in the interest of experimentation, I eventually decide to uh, incorporate it into my design. So here we've got a, an advanced SAS unit and an RCS tank and the new RCS thruster blocks. In fact, uh, the only part I'm not using in this design is the is the winglets, not the not the normal canards that I always use. See those those canards I always love. It's the other winglets that I can't stand. Anyway, uh, but uh, more or less my normal design, except with the advanced SAS and the RCS tank, which means it's heavier. So we'll see how it does. SAS on, throttle up. I've I got my joystick control proper, but you'll see it's twitching a lot. You can see pitch, yaw. The winglets are all flapping back and forth. That's advanced SES. I don't know what's so advanced about it that it's uh, deciding to twitch my controls all over the place. Anyway, off we go. Still no destination but orbit, of course. There's no new body, no celestial body. So there you see the primordial runway no particular use for it at the moment. Okay, off go the boosters. Of course, uh, I, I imagine that around this time was when uh, 
when C7 started making the space plane parts uh, out of the canards, right? Uh, what what happened was uh, C7 took the canard script or coding and uh, managed to make aircraft parts out of it. And that was the genesis of the space planes in KSP. And probably that's why the runway was uh, put there because that had started to occur. Okay, first stage out. Second stage lit with a bang. And on we go. Looking good so far. Despite the fact that it's heavier, it seems to be uh, well on its way to orbit. Not a guarantee, of course. Uh, the RCS tank uh, uh, plus the RCS thruster blocks is about an additional, additional, additional unit of, uh, of mass. We don't really know what the units of mass are at this point. It's not clearly tons because their relationship to the thrust isn't particularly clear. But uh, one more unit and so about uh, half the mass of one of the engines. I really still, uh, you can see the advanced SAS sort of uh, adding SAS torque constantly, but it's not clear that it's actually providing any new control. You can see it's uh, working very hard, but I don't know what it's working hard at most of the time. Otherwise, the SAS, ah, there we go, there we go. New feature, map view. Ah, we were all missing this, weren't we? Well, now I can make a proper orbit out of this. I don't have to wonder what my orbit is. No other celestial bodies, as you can see. So it's just Kerbin. But I am able to make a... Well, it's not the greatest orbit I've ever made. But at least it's uh, not excessive like the previous one. 250 by 50, not good. Uh, this is a tamer orbit. And hopefully we'll be able to bring this back down close to the KSC. We will see about that. I test out the RCS units, of course. Looking good. Um, with SAS on, though, there's uh, no particular translation occurring. I'll use it to retroburn later on, though. So uh, we'll get some use out of the RCS fuel we're carrying up. Another thing I wanted to test out was time warp. And one thing you'll notice is that the first stage of time warp is 2x, then the next stage is 5x, and then 10x. And that's basically what you're limited to if you're in low curve in orbit. So, not much there. I mean, a, a huge, huge benefit over not having time warp at all. But uh, still, I'm not what we're used to. Still took about, uh, what is it, uh, three to four minutes. No, no, it's, it was pretty short, actually, to get to apoapsis. And here I'm doing the retro burn. Uh, probably about two minutes to get to apoapsis much better than uh, waiting, what was it, 20 minutes, 15-20 minutes before. Yeah, that was bad. Okay, so uh, here is the state of my approach to the KSC after having made orbit. Coming back down, trying to hit it as closely as possible. And uh, dumping fuel Not a bad approach at all, and in fact, uh, I should have been able to make a pretty good KSC landing out of this. Except, uh, for some reason, I uh, I went a little bit awry here. I actually retro burned too much, you'll about near, and then uh, I eventually decide to correct too much, trying to head south here. You can see there. I just basically overdo it. Is the thing. By the time I realize that, it's already too late, and I'm headed for that little uh, lake valley there, trying to miss the mountains. But the funny thing about trying to miss the mountains is that you're so fixated on it, you actually tend to hit them. But, uh, yep, yeah. that's the end of the fuel. 
And let's see where we're landing. Actually, a little valley off to the side of the lake there. At least the mountains in this version aren't quite as uh, horrible as the ones that we now have in KSP. Parachute deployment. But let's see where we end up. Ah, on a slope. Ow, ow, ow. Hitting a slope at 12 meters per second. That's... Ouch. Okay, it seems stable, but then I get fascinated by this. The fact that it sinks into the terrain and pops back out again. I'm just curious, but then the last pop there decided... I'm not controlling this right now. The last pop decided to actually topple it over. And it started rolling down. And here I'm just watching in morbid fascination, of course. Uh, I'm trying to get it steady. You see SAS on. But it's still sort of glitchy there. Eventually it stops. And I get bored, so. 33.9 G's there, you see. Uh, so, so much for fixing that reading. Okay, so with that uh, successful orbit, uh, test of time warp, uh, test of the map view, RCS, we move on to version 0.12. Nothing obviously different here, but uh, there are big differences up ahead. Nothing different about the KSC itself, so no space plane hangar, but we do get a capsule selection thing. Still only one capsule, so I'm not entirely sure about the functionality of this. But okay, we select a command module. There is a load spacecraft option, but nothing there, of course. Uh, no default craft so far. Now we do have a new engine, the LVT-45, which we all know is the gimbling version of the LVT-30. And so that's an interesting development there. Otherwise, uh, no new parts. That's the only new part involved. But I'm going to try and incorporate that into the design, even though it has less thrust at the same mass as the LVT-30. Otherwise, nothing new. So, on to my usual design. I tried to make a new design by adding radial rockets here. Uh, not radial boosters, mind you. I mean actual uh, fuel tanks plus uh, LVT-30s. But uh, it turns out you can't attach fuel tanks to those radial couplers in this uh, version of KSP yet. So no go there. So I just default to my normal design. And uh, try to name it Moon Rocket. Because of course this version is the version that we can go to the moon. The moon is there. The moon has been added in 0.12. I put a question mark because I'm not entirely sure this is going to make it. I was pretty sure that the uh, version that I made in 0.09 could at least fly by the moon. But this one is also carrying the RCS tank. So I'm not totally sure how that's going to work out. RCS isn't as, as efficient as the normal fuel, I think. Anyway, off we go. Let's see if this can fly by the moon. That's the goal. I'm not trying to orbit or land or anything like that. Just to fly by. Everything functioning quite normally here. You can sort of appreciate the logic here that they didn't add the moon before adding map view and time warp and also the making sure that the landscape looked, per uh, looked at least decent. Because, of course, having the landscape uh, look glitchy at altitude would mean that looking back on Kerbin wouldn't look so good. So getting the landscape fixed up, getting the time warp in, getting map view, all very important additions before adding the moon. So here we are uh, on the main first stage, everything looking good. These are still LVT-30s. The second stage is made out of LVT-45s, if I recall correctly. And actually, that sort of makes the winglets, the canards there, redundant. But anyway. Not entirely sure about the relative efficiency of the LVT-45s versus the LVT-30s in terms of ISP, for instance, because there is no ISP indication yet. So, 
that is still something under development. I wonder what version they add the ISP and really nail down the thrust and mass to actual units, tons and kilonewtons. Doesn't seem like we're there yet. Anyway, uh, you can see the moon there. Obviously this is not the perfect time to transfer to the moon, so we're making orbit first. So I aim for that, uh, try and get a decent apoapsis, then circularize and all that. Of course, uh, there is no maneuver node system in this version yet. We just got the moon after all, so... Uh, the, the, wis the wisdom, of course, uh, handed down through generations of KSP players is that you burn for the moon when the moon appears over the horizon over Kerbin. So, that is the plan. And so I'm just gonna try and make orbit and then wait till I see the moon peek over the horizon and then start burning prograde at that point. So here we go, uh, this is the circularization burn to make orbit. Uh, I shouldn't call it a circularization burn, I never make it circular. Uh, it's just an orbital burn. It's... Uh, I appreciate those who uh, who are perfectionists and want uh, their orbit circular, but uh, there's no actual point uh, most of the time. Uh, so anyway, it's a matter of a handful of delta v in the end. But I uh, time warp, wait till I see the moon above the horizon there, pull the craft prograde. RCS obviously not necessary with all the torque that we have. Get it lined up and go. Delta V necessary to get to the moon is uh, the same. I think the the moon is in the same position, though it's hard to tell. We don't get too much information from this view. In fact, you'll see here it does not give any indication of the rendezvous as I get closer to the moon. Hitting moon's orbit, uh, no indication of how close we are or anything like that. Um, when you you can't uh, right click and uh, target the moon or anything like that uh, you can double click on it and that uh, focuses the view on it like that so but it, and it says target moon but that's not really what's going on not the way that we're used to it in uh, KSP now so uh, I just have to hope that I've got an encounter with the moon I decide to burn a little bit further you can see me doing that there and that's to give a little bit of buffer Basically what I'm doing is I'm ensuring that I spend more time close to the moon. Really I probably didn't need to do that. I would have gotten closer to the moon had I not. But, uh, but yeah, just in case I want to make sure. But this is the first view of us uh, leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence. Heading out. There you see a very high view of the terrain. Very nice that this isn't glitchy or anything like that. Very important. So even though point one zero wasn't a huge leap from point oh nine, it uh, was a very important one to set up this possibility and this uh, fairly magnificent view of Kerbin. You can imagine how how good the uh, original players of KSP felt about uh, getting to this point after all the <laughs> all the struggles, but also uh, how wonderful it was to see this happen. Moonar Sphere of Influence for the first time. We've got a high approach there, and we're just going to let it fly by. We're not going to try and tweak it or get closer. I want to get a look of the moon, a look at the moon, and uh, I got to say, it looks a lot like the Death Star. Uh, it looks it looks a lot more like the Death Star than I thought it would. Um, it, it certainly looks like it was more modeled off of the Death Star than, uh, than off of the actual moon. Uh, but there you are. Uh, whether it's really a moon or not, uh, I'll leave it to your discussion. Unfortunately, we're approaching the nighttime side. On the bright side, if you will, as you can see, we've got an interesting race between Kerbin and the moon to eclipse the sun. Which one will make it first? It actually depends on our point of view. If I turned the camera a little bit, it would uh, change the result. But um, it turns out that it is, in fact, the moon that gets there first. 
Of course, in Kerbal Space Program, solar eclipses are cheap. I'm not too sure about this little lighting effect here. I don't know if that's a feature or a glitch. <laughs> it's an interesting thing, either way. There it goes. Very different looking sun, of course, and I, I'm of two minds about whether this was better or worse. I, I really can't say. Uh, the current sun is a little bit lackluster. Anyway, but uh, here we are, returning back to Kerbin, and I have to do a little, well, actually a fairly long retro burn, and I decide to do it primarily with RCS since we haven't uh, used that yet. So I take a long time retro burning here. Uh, use about half of the RCS fuel and then eventually decide to switch to the rocket because I'm impatient. So uh, here we go, half of the RCS done, lit the rocket, bring it down to about 27 kilometers, 28 kilometers ish. That'll definitely get us down. No intention of hitting the KSC this time. It will be tough to hit the KSC like that when it's not giving me a T minus on the periapsis or anything like that. Uh, some indication of what my orbital period is or stuff like that is uh, very important if you're going to try and hit the KSC. Did give me an idea about a possible moon cycler because uh, the distance to the moon, it takes about six hours to uh, cover the distance to the moon and then six hours back and that happens to be Kerbin's rotational period. So if you made a made a sort of a craft that uh, could go back and forth, that would be interesting. Anyway, uh, it would uh, hit the KSC every time on the way back, right? Because it's six hours exactly. Anyway, just a thought. So here we go, uh, coming down, and somehow I always manage to hit the mountains. Uh, basically, I, I'm trying to avoid them, but I get fixated on them, and so I ended up uh, aiming right for them, basically. I'm not very good at this whole thing. The, the atmosphere is still very soupy, by the way. Uh, seems a bit thicker than, than it is in the current KSP. Can't be sure without uh, detailed testing, but I don't think I would have been brought down quite as sharply with a 28 kilometer periapsis uh, on a trip back from the moon in the current KSP. A little bit of explosion there, but I think it was just a parachute as it uh, comes to a halt. And there we have it, a successful flyby of the moon in version 0.12, naturally and uh, in the next episode, uh, and there will be a next episode, I will try landing on the moon, and that will be in 0.13, uh, possibly also 0.13.3, because that was, the I think, the final free version of KSP. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.